I'm Ron Pressler. I work in the Java platform group at Oracle. That's the team that develops OpenJDK. And I'm the technical lead for Project Loom that produced UserMO threads that made their way into JDK 19, released in September. The purpose of this particular talk is to explain why we've added UserMO threads to Java. In other talks I've given, uh, one of them is linked on the last slide, I talked more about why we decided to go with user mode threads as opposed to async await, but uh, this time I wanted to do something new and focus on why we did anything at all, especially since this conference is devoted to performance and there's some common misunderstanding over how user mode threads help performance. Now, the target domain for user mode threads in Java, or as we call them, virtual threads, is servers in particular and concurrency in general. So before we go any further, it is important to define what we mean by concurrency, especially in contrast to parallelism. Parallelism is the problem of accelerating the performance of a task, that is, reducing its latency, by splitting it down into multiple subtasks and employing multiple processing resources to cooperate on completing them. The source of the subtasks is internal. They're created by the parallel algorithm. Concurrency, in contrast, is a problem of scheduling to some set of resources many largely independent tasks that arrive from the outside, and we're mostly interested in throughput, or how many of these we can complete per time unit. Servers are a canonical example of concurrent programs, and we'll be talking mostly about servers. To understand the behaviour of servers, we'll use a famous result in operations research called Little's Law, or Little's Theorem which is very simple to state, but its proof is not trivial, as it applies to stochastic or probabilistic systems like servers, yet the result is independent of any probability distribution. The theorem applies to any stable system. A system, for our purposes, means some boundary with work items, uh, requests or customers, that enter from the outside, spend some time inside, and then exit. Any means that we can draw the boundary arbitrarily wherever we please. Stable means that an ever-growing set of those items don't accumulate inside uh, or in a queue on the boundary. In other words, that the number of work items here doesn't balloon forever, but that things come in and then come out. All the variables in the theorem refer to long-term averages, where long-term could mean some arbitrary time frame inside which we don't care about probabilistic fluctuations. Lambda is the average rate at which items, requests, arrive at the system. Because the system is stable, the rate at which they exit, which we also call throughput, must also equal lambda. Obviously, it can't be any higher, or we'll have more things leaving than entering, but it also can't be lower, because that would mean that an ever-growing queue will form and the system will not be stable. So in fact, we can now think of a stable system as one where things enter and exit at the same average rate. W is the average duration or latency that the items spend inside the boundaries of our system. We can choose the boundaries to correspond to different kinds of latencies and define the entry point and exit point to pick when we start and end measuring W. L is the average number of requests that will be concurrently inside the boundaries of our system. Now, given those definitions, the theorem says that this equation holds L equals lambda times W. Mm -hmm. It holds in every stable system, so if it ever doesn't, the system isn't stable. There are other ways of describing the, the mental image conjured by the theorem, but they're all equivalent. To get an intuition for why the theorem isn't affected by the distribution of requests, let's imagine that the system is running at full capacity. There are L bar requests inside, and no more can fit. Then, if the average request rate is lambda bar, the implied maximum throughput, the equation holds and the system is stable even if the request rate fluctuates. Now, why is that? If the rate of request momentarily rises above lambda bar, a queue will form on the system's boundary because no more requests can go inside. The queue is not necessarily a fair FIFO queue, and it doesn't even have to be physically implemented. That queue could just be people refreshing their browsers because their HTTP requests are rejected. It's just the set 
of requests or customers that are waiting to enter. But because lambda bar is the average, if the rate of requests ever rises above it, it is guaranteed to eventually fall below it, at which point the queue will deplete and the system is indeed stable because there is no ever-growing queue. Because Little's theorem applies to any system with arbitrarily drawn boundaries, it applies to any subsystem S of a system S prime. Importantly, for a system to be stable, all of its subsystems must be stable. Because if any of them weren't, that would mean that there would form an ever-growing queue at the entrance to it, and so eventually there would be an ever-growing accumulation of items for the containing system as well. Now what happens if we choose to include a physical proper 5 foot queue inside the boundaries of S prime, with n being the average number of items in the queue? First, we have lambda prime equals lambda, because all the requests that make it into S prime will end up in S. Next, L prime, the average number of requests inside S prime, is equal to L plus n, those inside S plus those in the queue. Finally, we have W prime uh, equal to W plus n over L. Why? Because a request has to spend W time inside S, and it has to wait for the n requests in the queue, each will also spend W time inside S, but we can think of them as doing it in batches of size L. So we substitute, and we see that n, the q, cancels out from both sides of the equation. The q, therefore, might have a positive effect on fairness, and so the experience of an individual user, but it has no effect on the averages. This means that we can exclude any q's from the analysis, if it's convenient to do so, without affecting the measures we're interested in. We can also use Little's, uh, Little's Law to consider cases where requests that Hit a cache with probability p are very quick, while those that miss it take longer, and use that to size the cache appropriately for the system's capacity. Or we can use it to see the effect of uh, interference among tasks, meaning cases where the more requests that are in the system, the more they, they interact and slow each other down, and then see why in all well-functioning servers the interaction among tasks must be low, that is, why they must be largely independent. Uh, I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but you can go over the slide later. And now, let's make things more concrete and talk specifically about software servers. An incoming request will spend some average duration, W, inside our server. Of course, we try to reduce that duration as much as possible, optimizing our latency, but ultimately W depends on the inherent properties of our particular system the network topology, the database latency, the algorithmic work we need to do, etc. And W becomes a constant of our system. During that amount of time, the request consumes resources. Memory, CPU, network bandwidth, DB connections, etc. That resource consumption determines how many requests can live concurrently inside the system. And that is our capacity, L bar. And that capacity determines the maximum throughput, lambda bar, that we can achieve. Specifically, every request consumes some amount of CPU. So let's start by considering just the CPU as our system. The maximum capacity of requests inside the CPU is equal to the number of calls. So if we have 30 calls, and every request consumes an average uh, of 100 microseconds of CPU time, which is quite a lot uh, and amounts to over uh, 1,500 cache misses, then the CPU could handle a throughput of 30,000 requests per second. To handle a higher throughput, we need more capacity, and we can do that by adding more servers. Remember that we can draw boundaries to include many servers and apply little theorem to the entire cluster. But servers cost money, and so we want to utilize each one as best as we can, and that's the problem virtual threads aim to solve. To see why that is, let's delve deeper into how we write the server. Our problem domain, that of a server, has a clear unit of concurrency, meaning a task that is largely independent of others, the request. Now, Java was one of the first languages to have threads as part of its standard library and language specification, and the thread is the platform's software unit of concurrency. And the easiest approach in Java and languages like it is therefore to represent the domain unit of concurrency with the software unit of concurrency. 
And that is the traditional style of writing servers called thread per request. In that style, a request is mapped to a thread for its entire duration. Now, if every request consumes uh, a thread for its duration, then the average number of threads that will be used concurrently is equal to L. Even if our server implements a queue before assigning a thread to a request, we can exclude it from our system with no effect on the metric we're interested in, namely the number of threads, because as we saw before, the queue cancels out from the equation. Now, the mapping between requests and threads in the thread per request style is not always exactly one-to-one. -one. Sometimes, in the process of handling a request, we need to make multiple outgoing requests to other services and we reduce the latency by issuing them in parallel, which in this style is done on multiple threads. But this reduces the latency by exactly the same amount in which uh, it increases the number of threads. And so it cancels out from the equation. So for the purpose of estimating the number of threads we need, we can consider W to be the duration that handling the request would take if it were all done in a serial fashion on a single thread. So how many threads do we need to utilize the resources of the server? If we consider the example we saw in a previous slide, where a request consumes 100 microseconds of CPU time on average, which is quite high, and the overall duration of the request is 10 milliseconds, which is quite low considering that it amounts to the sum of all the latencies of all the service and database calls we issue when processing the request, then we'd need uh, 100 threads for every core of CPU uh, we have. Conversely, uh, if we have only, say, 30 threads uh, per call for a total of about 900 threads, the server will reach its maximum capacity at merely 30% CPU utilization, which is indeed what we often see. Now, in other scenarios, that number uh, could be as high as 1,000 or even 10,000 uh, threads per call uh, required to make good use of the hardware. And that is quite a lot of threads. And when we consider that most uh, threads are used by outgoing fan out calls and just perform a single HTTP request, we expect those latter cases of 1,000 uh, or 10,000 threads per call to be quite common, and they are. On top of that, we need even more threads for programming convenience, such as having a thread for writing and a thread for reading uh, for each HTTP request. And this is the problem the OS cannot support that number of frequently active threads. So what do those who want to utilize their hardware well do? They abandon the thread per request style in favor of a style that does not represent the domain's unit of concurrency, the request, with a thread, but rather with some other software unit, the software unit of concurrency, such as an asynchronous pipeline. And that is the asynchronous style of programming. But the asynchronous style brings its own host of serious problems. That's because from the language, through the libraries, and all the way to the tools, the Java platform is organized around threads. The language's basic constructs of statement sequences, loops, method calls, and exceptions are confined to a thread. Exception stack traces give us troubleshooting context in the form of a thread's call stack. We use thread locals to give operations implicit context by attaching data to a thread. When we debug, we step through the execution of a thread. And profilers group events by threads. And we lose all that when we abandon the thread per request model in favor of asynchronous code. Programmers were therefore facing a dilemma. Waste money on hardware due to low utilization, or waste money on development and maintenance due to a programming style that's uh, disharmonious with the design of the platform. The solution we've chosen for Java is the one chosen uh, by Erlang and Go, user mode threads that can be plentiful, because that's what's required by Little's law to reach high throughput. In Java, we call these user mode threads virtual threads in a non to virtual memory. Virtual threads are implemented by the Java runtime, which knows how Java uses the stack and manages memory at a lower granularity than the OS can. So instead of a couple of thousand threads at the most, we can have millions of them in the same process. They can be so plentiful that we can create a new virtual thread for every concurrent operation, even as small as a single outgoing HTTP call or a database query. This removes the thread limitation L bar 
while keeping the Threadbare Request style, which is the only style that's harmonious with the design of the platform and its tooling. Indeed, when we compared a pool of OS threads to virtual threads in a popular Java server employing the Threadbare Request style, we saw that the server destabilized at the exact moment Little's theorem predicted it would, when the request rate reached uh, the maximum number of threads divided by the request duration, which in this case was 100 milliseconds, uh, uh, 100 milliseconds or one tenth of a second. Of course, eventually hardware resources like RAM, CPU, and network bandwidth are exhausted, and if there is some interaction among requests, uh, things no longer scale linearly, but uh, we certainly have much more room to grow. Uh, I've seen various discussions online where some people think that the performance benefit of user mode threads comes from having faster context switches. So let's examine that. A context switch occurs when an operation needs to wait for some external signal. And so we schedule it from the CPU and schedule another in its stead. Context switching directly impacts the latency W. For simplicity, let's assume that an average request is made up of some end blocking operations. Each incurs a wait for some uh, external uh, trigger like IO plus a context switch. Therefore, the impact of context switches on latency and throughput is the ratio between the average duration of a context switch and the average wait time. Of course, the context switch takes place on the CPU and so impacts WCPU as well, uh, but still the overall impact is low in comparison to the orders of magnitude increase in thread capacity offered by user mode threads. Still, virtual threads do have a faster context switch in OS threads, and the structure concurrency API in JDK19 also makes it easy to wait for multiple operations with a single context switch. Finally, another subject that uh, frequently comes up when discussing user mode threads is scheduling policy. Virtual threads are not cooperative. In cooperative scheduling, the scheduling points or context switch points, the points where uh, the points in the code where we deschedule a thread and schedule another are statically known. In non-cooperative scheduling, they can potentially happen anywhere. The cooperative model is less composable because adding a scheduling point to a subroutine might break the assumptions of all of its transitive callers. In the non-cooperative model, if a subroutine wants to exclude other threads from interfering with some shared resource, it can do that with a mutex. However, even though the Java runtime has the ability to preempt a running virtual thread at any point, the virtual thread scheduler does not currently use that power to implement time sharing. Time sharing is when the scheduler preempts a thread that's been using the CPU for some a lot to time share, even in the middle of a loop performing uh, some pure computation. And there are two reasons for why we're not doing that yet. First, there's probably no urgency because people overestimate their reliance on time sharing in server software. In non-real-time kernels, real-time kernels are a different matter, time sharing is mostly an emergency measure, and even the OS uses it mostly when the CPU is at 100% utilization. People don't no normally run their servers at 100% CPU for any extended duration, and so they don't really rely on time sharing. Those that do try running the server at 100% CPU aren't particularly happy with its behavior. Second, Deciding when and how to employ time sharing in a way that's actually useful uh, is not easy when you have five orders of magnitude more threads than CPU cores. The operational range at which time sharing could help is rather narrow in this case, when the number of CPU hungry threads is greater than the number of cores, but not much greater. And so we decided to gather uh, more data and do more research on what problems uh, people actually encounter in the field before adopting time sharing. In summary, the main quality that gives user mode threads uh, their performance is not fast context switching, but their multitude. And with that, I am done. And in the next slide, you will find a couple of links for more information. Thank you.